Hey guys, and welcome to the Alabama Saltwater Fishing Report presented by Angelo Di Paola, the coastal connection with EXP Realty. The first podcast to bring you the local inshore, offshore, and onshore fishing report, whether it's good, bad, or ugly. All right, guys, before we jump into the reports this week, we've got a really cool opportunity for you. We have partnered with AFCO, and they are offering all of our listeners a free sun protection mask with any purchase of AFCO products. They make a ton of great products for all types of anglers. All you have to do to get your coupon code is text FISHING to 314 314- Six six five one seven six seven. Again, just text the word fishing to three one four six six five one seven six seven to subscribe to our email list and we'll send you the promo code via email. All right, guys, we have a great Alabama saltwater fishing report lined up for you this week. But first, let's take a few minutes to check out a few of this week's great sponsors. This week's Alabama saltwater fishing report is brought to you by Sportsman's Marine. Sportsman's Marine has an extensive tackle selection of anything that local anglers need for saltwater and freshwater fishing, as well as boating accessories. They have the largest selection of the slick lure in Mobile and Baldwin County. They have AFCO, Pelagic, and Saltwater Fanatics apparel along with other local brands. Go check out their Edgewater, Wellcraft, and Vexus lines of boats. They offer engine services with five stars. Star, Yamaha, and Mercury Mechanics. Also, if you're looking for a street legal electric golf cart, go check out their Atric golf carts. Sportsman's Marine on Highway 98, and they also have a downtown location next to Mr. Gene's Beans in Fairhope, Alabama. And also brought to you by Mallard Bay. MallardBay.com is the Airbnb style marketplace for discovering and booking your next guided hunting and fishing adventures. The Mallard Bay platform was built by sportsmen for sportsmen. Their mission is to help expand access to affordable and successful hunting by connecting you with verified outfitters across the United States. You can browse trips and prices by state or species, select the dates you'd like to go, message outfitters, and secure your dates all from one platform. MallardBay.com. Not sure where you want to go yet? Reach out to them on Instagram or Facebook, and they can help you find your dream hunt. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the show. I'm your host, Butch Theory. I'm joined today with Angelo DePaola as my co-host. How are we doing today, Angelo? Man, I am doing great. Just another bright, sunny day. I mean, we've got some cold weather, which Finally. I am I'm so excited about the show today, Butch. Like, I think we're kind of doing a focus on inshore, kind of what we talked about, but yeah. like, you know, you got to feel like these tidal rivers are going to kick off if they're not already. Yep. Yep. I'm curious to talk to uh, Captain Richard. We have a new contributor today, Captain Collier. Very excited to talk to both of those guys. I know Captain Collier has been doing some trout stuff and some sheep's head. So we'll deep dive on some sheep's head. And I know Captain Richard's been chasing those trout and probably redfish too mixed in. I would have to imagine. I would imagine. Dude, this time of year that Dixie Bar is is hot. Yep. I imagine they've been out there. They're catching them. I think I saw Patrick on Facebook or something with a bunch of sheep set. So yeah, yep, they've been around. Man, fishing's been heating up for sure, and I am also glad that it's cooled off. It's a little windy today. I could deal without the wind, but man, it's been uh, it's been nice these past couple of days. This little cool down's been welcomed for sure. Oh yeah. What are you guys seeing over there as far as real estate goes? Any new updates? I mean, look, the market is pretty dynamic right now. I, I think like. I'd be interested to go back and see like what I was thinking about the market. So I'm on here about once a month with you yeah. and, and, and like, you could kind of see like in my head, I kind of see the build up, the fear building. Hey, now it's become, no, it's noticeable. Well, I mean, it's really noticeable now. I mean, we're up in 7% interest rate territory, you know, we, stuff sitting on the market. I think in orange beach, for instance, when we looked this week, October 2022 versus October 2021, we're down 45% in the amount of closed transactions. Wow. I don't want to call it a bloodbath, but it is a sharp downturn. We're starting to see prices pull back, uh, not major pullbacks, 3 to 4%, but you got to figure when we extrapolate that out into 2023, and I think we're going to be looking at what we're looking at right now in 2023 maybe some slightly higher interest rates so uh, you know if you're on the sell side it's uh you got to ask yourself why are you selling are you selling because you're moving to another area or you've got a raise your family's growing or shrinking you know those sort of things because with this with seven percent interest rates it's just going to your affordability really goes down the good news is is if you're a buyer is that if there was ever an opportunity to negotiate, right now is the opportunity to negotiate. If, if you're out there buying and you're working with a real estate professional, hey, look, throw some offers out there. Hey, we can't afford what we could afford last year at, at this price. 
because the interest rates have gone up. And the other thing is, is you don't necessarily need to negotiate so much off the price. I mean, there's some great loan products out there. There's some ARM products. There's a, a thing called a 2-1 buy down where for the first year of the mortgage, it's 2% ab- below whatever the, ad- whatever the 30 year is. And then the next year it's 1% below. Hmm. So, you know, when we're talking about real estate, talking about usually the greatest wealth piece in most people's wealth portfolio and so we got to look at it as a whole thing and what do we think mortgage rates are going to eventually do once we get inflation under control mortgage rates will come back down probably somewhere in the fives so look marry the house don't marry the mortgage divorce the 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 rent if you're out there paying rent and you feel like you're stuck look you're not stuck uh you know we go over this scenario with a lot of our buyers because when we uh, when we talk about hey you bought something we've got you into debt now we got to get you out out of debt all real estate is is a leveraged investment you put five percent down on a piece of property the property goes up ten percent well you're a hundred percent return on your initial five percent investment you gotta have a place to live and that's the first piece in creating wealth and next piece is have some reserves next piece is max out your uh, IRA and your four hundred one k from your employer and the third piece is investing in, in in the stock market. That's the three things or four things that you should do. And own a piece if you if you have enough wealth, you own a, you own a second home or investment property. Pretty simple. But the yeah. market as it is, interest rates are up, sales are down. Expect that through most of next year with some relief coming maybe the end of next year, the beginning of 2024. What does it mean to you whenever you say dynamic? You said the market is dynamic. It's shifting and, and, and it's, it's becoming very apparent to everybody, you know, and we're still in that shift. And the reason I say that is it's very hard for people to wrap their heads around. If your neighbor sold their house three, four, five months ago for 750,000 and you're getting offers at 600,000. I think that's a tough pill for a lot of people to swallow, but that's the current scenario. And guess what? I don't see any scenarios where it gets better. It was very interesting last week, the CPI report, the consumer price index came out and it was 7.7 versus 7.9, which is what they were projecting, which means inflation was starting to come down. So what you saw was the 10 year treasury note, dropped and so did interest rates drop dropped about a quarter of a point or more and then what happened what happened on sunday the fed came out and said hey guys you are overreacting to this good news and we are going to continue to hike rates up because just because you only slammed one finger in the door (laughs) they'll slammed a finger in the door you know so and then you immediately saw the the ten year treasury note go up, and you saw mortgage rates go up. The Fed is is going to create some pain. They want to put us into a recession. We have to get unemployment up to about four point four percent is what they're shooting for. So they're going to continue to do that. They're going to continue to raise rates until we do that. The only people I've heard of being laid off is Twitter and Meta. Like mm-hmm. I don't know anybody personally that's been laid off. I think when I talk to brick and mortar homeowners, I mean, business owners, they're still looking for employees. So we're all going to have to feel some more pain, unfortunately, until we start seeing some reprieve. And uh, man, them's the breaks. Yeah, (laughs) we'll see. Yeah. Time will tell, man. We appreciate the real estate update as always. Uh, You guys check out the Coast Connection if you have any real estate needs. Man, this is what I'll say. When you work with us, we work to not just be a commodity. We want that to be an experience. So I think when people come in and work with us, you know, not only do we have the opportunity to put your home in front of everybody that listens to your show, but we have a whole staff of people. We're not laying anybody off. We've been very fortunate to have outsized profits the past two years, which means we have a lot of dry powder, which means we're going to continue to put a lot of pressure on the market. So when it turns, we're ready. But if you want somebody that's going to give you good, honest, fair advice, and sometimes that advice is, hey, look, you're thinking about selling just because you want to put some money in the in your bank account. Yeah, maybe we need to talk in about two or three years. Uh, you know, those are we're, we're having really tough and honest conversations with people about what they should be doing. I think that that is a, a rarity, especially when people are running scared. And I will tell you, people in my industry and in the mortgage industry 
are running scared and I don't think they give good advice when they're running scared. And we're, while we're feeling some pain, I would say that we're not running scared. Yeah. Holding steady. It shows for sure, man. Yep. We'll appreciate the advice for sure, man. Well, let's, uh, let's get into this report, man. Let's go down and see what captain Richard Rutland's up to a cold blood fishing. Can't wait. All right, cat. Welcome back to the show, man. Tell us a fish story. What you been chasing? Butch, daddy, Angelina, what's going on boys? Trying to stay warm, man. Trying to stay warm. I mean, I'm just waiting to hear a good fishing report. Like, I know this cold weather set in. These uh, tidal rivers and tributaries have to be starting to produce. And I'm cur- curious to see, look, if Bobby's the, what do we call Bobby? Marshall the, of the Mississippi Sound. Ma- we got to have a nickname for, <laughs> for, for Ricardo here. <laughs> Hey, hey, I got I got plenty of nicknames. Ricardo, That's right. Captain Dick, uh <laughs> Cold Blooded. I got a, I got a bunch of nicknames, man. Captain That's Blood. True. That's what, Captain Blood. Yeah, that's what uh Baya, Baya likes to call me Captain Blood. Yeah. I got plenty. We can uh, we can we can go down the list. Man, uh I tell you, you talked about it being cold this morning. Uh it was chilly this morning, but the fish didn't know it because they were uh they were on fire. We had a good had a real good trip, man. Caught a uh caught a lot of fish on top water this morning believe it or not and all the way through the morning you know we had all this kind of uh almost uh overcast mostly cloudy kind of kind of uh condition all morning uh which really always lends well to top water fishing and we caught a caught a bunch of fish on top water this morning and for that matter uh i don't think we got any bites down near the bottom everything was in the upper part of the water column just because it got cold all of a sudden, uh, everybody's mindset to go to uh, to fishing deep and it being cold. You know, uh, the the water temperature was right there, still in the lower 60s. I think I was seeing like 60 to 62 degrees, something like that, all morning. Uh, and then the next couple of days, uh, that's going to continue to fall a little bit. Looks like we've got a low in the uh, lower night. And then, which today's Wednesday, so I think it's lower 40s tonight, and I think it's Thursday night and Friday night go into the lower lower 30s or mid, mid to lower 30s. Yeah. So hopefully that water, you know, I, I'm kind of hoping for the water temperature to come on down a little bit and just see what's going to happen there. We've been singing the blues about the fall fishing all year. Uh, or all, all fall, I mean, um, not not really everything not really coming together. So I'm really looking forward to seeing what what a little bit of cold's going to do to them. You know, if it's going to group them up or 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 what the heck is going on. You know, because um, we've had a couple of reports here. Uh, you know, with the podcast uh, about the causeway kind of getting going, and then uh, and then it kind of falls apart, and then some of these tidal rivers getting going and falling apart. And we've had this kind of up and down motion with the um with the with the temperature swing, you know. So I was telling uh Captain Patrick the other day, I was like, Man, I wish it'd just go on and rain and yeah. uh and, and, and flood flood the bay, you know, <laughs> at some point because it's like you feel like the fish need to something drastic needs to happen to almost group them up to a degree because it's it's been a tough fall. Uh had a great day today in one of the tidal rivers in uh off of mobile bay this morning and the uh man really the uh the thing to talk about has been the red fishing uh i had a really couple of really good trips last week in the northern part of the mississippi sound in some of the creeks and uh bayous and things like that on redfish slot redfish are just wall to wall in some of these uh some of these creeks and stuff down the northern mississippi sound you know and basically what i've been doing is uh getting on the if the tide's high enough going up in the creeks and when it's lower, uh, staying on the outside of some of those, uh, those creeks and been able to sight cast a bunch of fish, you know, see, see pushes and blow ups and things like that. And of course I've got that, uh, I've got my contender bay, uh, rigged out with the, uh, with the tower. So I've been standing up there on top of the tower and, uh, helping some of my customers sight cast some redfish with some, uh, spoons and slick lures. Man, that sounds awesome. That's fun. That sounds like a great time. Yep, we uh we we definitely did it today. Kind of targeted some trout early, and then um and then transitioned over to uh to doing some of that sight fishing a little bit later in the afternoon, about eleven you know eleven twelve o'clock something like that. 
and uh, once the sun kind of got up and it was it was on like a chicken bone the uh we got this uh north wind blowing and a falling tide and the water was all dropped out of uh one of the creeks that i went in and and the fish were definitely up on the banks and feeding they were they were on the chew it's definitely happening that sounds awesome man i know you were talking about trout a little bit uh you said they were kind of staying up in the water column um top water did well what else are you guys catching them on the uh the slick junior did real good in the um in the i guess they're calling it sand lavender like kind of like that um off color pearl yeah that that they're making the um cool beans was real good the goblin was real good in the color in in those colors uh and then on the big slick the cool beans, the croaker, and the goblin was was, was our go tos this morning. So dark sand and, lights uh, were working. Oh yeah, yep, yep. And so it, did, it didn't really make a whole lot of sense to what we talk about when we're when we're always talking about trying to match match the color to whatnot. You know, just like you said, it, some days it doesn't matter. You know, I really felt like the it was just hungry today. Yeah, up on my way up on my way up the river this morning. I saw three or four slicks that I passed on my way up and kind of my thought process was I'm going to run on up the river and we got this falling tide in North wind and I'm going to let the tide and the wind kind of, kind of just pull the boat out of the river, you know? So I made this one giant long drift all morning, uh, hitting all the areas and I spot, I spot locked on the uh, trolling motor several times on some, on some good hot bites. We had one good one, probably about, nine o'clock this morning where I spot locked for about two hours and, and it was every cast, you know, we're getting a bite. Uh, but the funny thing was, is like I said, the, the only way we were catching them was in the upper part of the water column. We were anchored up in about 10 foot of water, but, uh, you couldn't catch anything on a grub. It was either a slick lure, a junior or a top water hmm. was, was, uh, was, was the ticket. Uh, they were definitely up on the surface and it, it kind of felt like to me that they were, we were catching the fishes more on the deep water ledges, uh, more so than the bank points or things like that. It, it, it seemed like the deeper deep water ledges. And when I say deep water ledges, you know, where you've got like a, like a four to six foot flat dropping off into like, you know, 10 or 12, 15 foot of water, uh, is, is what it felt like to me, uh, was going on. But that, uh, that this that that kind of thing this time of year kind of changes daily you know what i mean i feel like if you have like a little bit of a a little bit of a warm up period they'd get up against the banks and get more on the flats you know but they were they were just kind of hanging right there on the edge in between what i call the flats and the in the river channels is what it felt like today yeah i would have to imagine that even this time of year like you're talking about the fish getting bunched up a little bit i would have to imagine that even like a you know a, a hard north wind or a hard south wind is going to change that oh yeah for sure. Yep. We're kind of going into a nip tide this weekend. So, uh, so some of that might change as well. You might be looking more for a water level, right? Water level area versus a, uh, you know, some of the water movement areas where we're finding that those, uh, those deep water ledges at, you know, and it looks like, it looks like looking from the tide chart, it looks like the dip's only going to be for a, for a couple of days and it's going to get, it's going to get strong again and start, uh, start moving pretty good so we'll see richard what are you seeing as far as bait in, in the rivers there's still a lot of mullet in the tidal rivers um and that's that's always real typical of this year is for the mullet to just be wall to wall in some of these rivers and uh what they're doing is the mullet are spawning right now and then what will happen is as we get these uh we these stronger cold fronts like what we're about to experience here i don't know if it'll quite do it on this cold front because it's not really getting down to like the, the freezing mark. And I don't know exactly what the water temperature has to get to push them out, but those all those big mullet that we're seeing in the rivers right now, they're going to fall out eventually uh, with some of this cooler weather. They're going to push out after they spawn, but there's lots of mullet in there. There's lots of little finger mullet in there. And then I'm still seeing pogies flip, still seeing the, uh, the liar birds. Uh, or politician birds, as I like to call them, <laughs> diving on some of those little uh, little pogey full uh, pogey schools and things like that. So uh, there's still some pogies and some uh, some shad and stuff in the rivers. But uh, I look to see. Ho hopefully, um, 
this good cold front we're going to get. It looks like it's going to last for a little while. Like the, the cold's actually going to last for, you know, at least the next foreseeable, like four or five, six days, something like that might help flush some of that stuff out of the rivers and get them out of there. And what's going to happen then is all the bait's going to leave out of there, but the trout and the redfish and everything are not going to leave out of there. And they will, uh, and then that's when it gets really fun to me because uh, you start fishing artificial lures like we like to do this year. And I feel like the fish don't really have a, a choice but to, but to feed. And that's why they get real aggressive in the winter. Uh, in my opinion, is that when you have the lack of bait in in an area, they see anything moving, any any, any kind of anything like that, they have they have to strike at it to uh, to live through the yeah. winter. So I, I think that's what's going on. It's a lot less competition for your artificial lure. That's correct. Yeah. Well, man, those are some great tips, and uh, it's a good report. Anything that you can think of that made the difference in the last couple of days in the rivers that you'd give our listeners some direction on? Uh, well, there's definitely, uh, there's definitely areas in the river right now where, uh, where you're seeing like a lot of life, like an overflux of life almost, you know, because like I said, these mullet are spawning in that river right now. And I say that river in the rivers right now, they're spawning in the rivers. And I've definitely noticed that like, if you go either up river and you get up above them, you're not catching anything, and if you go down down river and go below them, you're not catching anything. The the the, the fish are definitely living and uh, being active and feeding around those schools of mullet. Uh, it's almost distracting how many mullet are in some of these places right now. To the degree where like you, you it's like anywhere you look, there's just mullet jumping all over the place, you know. And usually you're just kind of looking for like just a few jumping here, a few jumping there. Like okay, I go I go get on that bank over there. That looks fishy, you know. But it's like Everywhere you look, there's mullet <laughs> jumping, you know. So, yeah. it's, Man, what a it's, great uh, tip, though. Like, yeah. I mean, you're fishing probably a handful of rivers, but like a, when you look on both the eastern and western shore of Mobile Bay, I mean, these tidal rivers, they're all pretty much the same sort of thing. Yep. I mean, I'm over here. And I know I'm not going where you're fishing, so I kind of want to go test out what's happening over here in our rivers. Right. Yep. And I, and I would assume that it, it all it all has to uh to kind of match up the same. Be pretty similar, I would, I would think. With, yeah. Yep. I would assume with that. I I don't fit. I don't fish over there on that east side, man. With you dirty boys over there, you know. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm a west side rat over here. Me and Butch, you know, That's we right. hard. We hard over here on the west side, you know. That's right. <laughs> man, let, me, let me tell but, you, uh, I met some boys from Bond Secure lately. And, and they might as well just grown up with us. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I believe yeah. that. Bon secure. I oh, believe yeah. that. But yeah, that's where, that's where you're going to find the life at, man. Uh, you know, good fishing activity is where, where the life is, you know what I mean? Where you're finding a bunch of those mullet and stuff like that. I, it's, it's kind of rare this time of year in the fall where you're, um, not seeing a bunch of bait activity either on your bottom machine or or uh or or surface activity and you're not catching some fish in that area but like i said it's kind of distracting to a degree in certain areas with with how much life there is but like i said up above or below that area you there, there's nothing happening so that's mm. that's that's where you want to be almost right now is just you know drop in one of your tidal rivers and head on you know either start at the top or start at the bottom and uh, run along till you start seeing pogies slipping or seeing some uh, some mullet jumping and whatnot, and then gives you gives you a real good starting point there. That that's where the biomass of life is usually right around that bait. Man, that's a great report from River Running Rutland. I think that's what I'm gonna call you from now on. <laughs> I got another nickname. <laughs> that's right, Captain Rutland, the River Runner. <laughs> Man, that's a great report. Those are some great tips. Well, good deal, man. Well, I appreciate y'all having me on here and uh, glad to talk to y'all as always. Absolutely, man. If folks want to get up with you and book a trip for some of this winter fishing, what's the best way to get in touch with you? Yep. Check us out at coldbloodedfishing.com. We're on Instagram and Facebook. I hadn't started a TikTok thing uh, <laughs> like Patrick Garmson has. That's probably for the best. Yeah, maybe I'll be the next new uh, the next new hit on there, huh? <laughs> next new talk star. <laughs> <laughs> that's right that's right all and, right uh, boys y'all have a good one thank you for having me you too man we appreciate it look forward to hearing from you next time be safe out there all right guys that was a great inshore report from captain richard rutland the old river runner let's take a quick break and check out a few of this week's sponsors that segment was brought to you by united bank 
United Bank knows what an important role agriculture plays in our local economy. At United Bank, they are here to support local farmers with financial products and services designed specifically for agribusiness, including real loans for farmland, equipment loans, working lines of credit, and more. Truth is, they deeply value the contributions agriculture makes to our communities, and they help our local farmers build successful businesses. They want to see you succeed. Learn more at unitedbank.com or stop by any United Bank branch. United Bank, all loans subject to credit approval, equal housing opportunity lender, member FDIC. And also brought to you by Foster Contracting, Fortified Roofing Pros. Often when a business is small, you miss the professionalism you get with larger companies. That's not the case with Fortified Roofing Pros. They're a family-owned business that is big enough to get the job done, but small enough to care. If you're looking for quality construction with a dependable, licensed, and certified Fortified Roofing Professional, give the Fortified Roofing Pros a call at 251-973-9999. Remember to support the local businesses that make your local podcast possible and check them out at fortifiedroofingpros.com. All right, Angelo, let's keep this inshore extravaganza going. Let's head on down and talk to Captain Collier, man. We got a new contributor this week that I'm very excited to hear from, Captain Brandon Collier. Captain Collier Charters, welcome to the Fishing Report. Cap, how are we doing today? Oh, great. What's going on, fellas? Glad to be on the podcast. Good, man. Glad to have you. Um, since you're new to our audiences, kind of tell us a little bit about Captain Collier, kind of what you do, what you specialize in, what kind of boats you run, kind of that kind of deal. All right. Yeah. So I don't, I wouldn't say I specialize in much of anything. I, mm-hmm. I kind of uh, dip into all kinds of fishing. So I'm a recreation fisherman. I'm a charter guide and a content creator here along the Mississippi Sound, Mobile Bay area. And uh, I, I run a 22 foot bay boat, sea hunt. I do a lot of inshore fishing some near shore and offshore fishing when the, the weather's good for me. But uh, here lately, I've been targeting a lot of sheep's head. And uh, that's, that's been the name of the game for the last two months for me anyways, for my charters and also some of my YouTube videos as well. But uh, ready to talk to y'all about it. I'll tell you my tactics, what I've been doing and all that good stuff. Heck yeah, man. Sheep's head are, uh, it's a good time of year for that. Um, it's a fun fish to catch. It's a delicious fish to eat. And yeah, I saw you doing some uh, fun stuff with the sheep's head with the Calcutta pole, man. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. So, uh, been, uh, I've got a buddy on the island. He's got a bunch of bamboo and I just had a random idea to go cut some down. And, you know, like we've got some, some structure around the Mississippi sound that I thought would be perfect that we could use these bamboo poles for to catch these fish. And so, uh, I ended up getting two or three of the cane poles. Some that are kind of thicker than others have a little bit more action flex to them. I put some monofilament line on them, rigged it up just like I normally would sheep's head fishing, grabbed some crabs, and uh, yeah, I've been doing really well on the cane pole for sheep's head. Not just small ones either. I've caught some 17, 18, 19 inches, and uh, it's it's really fun, and it's, it's crazy because the structure that I'm fishing, it's really hard to actually use a rod and reel, so it's more it's better to use the cane pole in my opinion the stuff yeah. that i'm fishing versus a rod and reel and that's it's more what, fun yeah that's what i was going to ask actually was you know what what do you feel like are the advantages and disadvantages of doing that well the disadvantage is uh you don't have any drag <laughs> right. that's the main disadvantage <laughs> right. Uh, right but try and compensate with that with uh just putting the heat on the fish and uh you got some good stretch with that monofilament line so just been kind of yanking them out of the structure as fast as possible and just kind of throw them in the boat. I actually caught a black drum, about a 27, 28 inch drum on this pole uh, a couple of weeks ago. And that kind of caught me off guard. And I found out when you don't have drag, <laughs> those suckers are strong. <laughs> I bet. Yeah, I can't even imagine you needed a, a fighting belt that came for that cane pole, I bet. Yeah. And since then, I've added a cork. I tied on to the <laughs> end of the pole. And uh, just in case, you know, I hook something big and I can just kind of let it go and let it float off. But uh, I kind of got that idea from, you know, the locals around the area that do triple tail fishing. Yeah, I know uh, some of them use cane poles for triple tail fishing. I have yet to try that. Uh, I do want to try that next year, get some live shrimp, hit some buoys and, and stuff like that. I, I feel like that would be really fun as well. It is. That's actually how I caught my first triple tail ever. It's in a 16 foot fiberglass really? boat with a Calcutta pole. Absolutely. <laughs> yes, sir. That, that is awesome. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but. Fun. One of the things, like Brandon's, he's, he's like a little bit humble here because we, I run this floor bevin fishing rodeo. I mean, he's won the dang thing, the master angler twice. And every <laughs> year I, I forget who he is. He comes in, he always has sheep. Well, he usually has black drum, jack reval, gaff tops, and stingrays. Yeah, sir, sure. And I'm like, oh, Collier from the island. And I always ask him if he's related to Clinton. 
Yeah, I forget. I always forget what he tells me. Vaguely related, it seemed like. Yeah, I think uh, all those cargoes are related somehow, aren't they? Yeah, somewhere down the line, cargoes, <laughs> tankers, base charges, they were all related somehow. Uh, That's right. But yeah, Angelo, that y'all y'all have one of the, one of my favorite, actually my favorite rodeo to fish is the Florida rodeo, and it's pretty much for that reason. You know the the topic of the rodeo is like you can catch anything anywhere. You could be fishing off the dock and possibly win. And that's kind of what I do in that rodeo is go for quote trash fish, which win the same prizes that, you know, people that go offshore catch grouper and king mackerel and stuff. Man. No, you always, I mean, it, it, it's amazing to see what you bring in because I, I grew up fishing for trash fish too. So I mean, when somebody brings in a 30 plus pound Jack Raval, and black drum north of 35 pounds like you know <laughs> i think the the, the jack Raval to me you know the 25 to 28 to 29 pounders are fairly common but when you start getting mm-hmm. 32 and 33 pound jack Raval, those are you you got to catch about 50 of them for what i remember to catch one about that big and, and same thing with the black drum and, and the big stingrays and cat so that's what i love oh, about yeah. radio but hell you're just a fish killing machine so i'm excited to have you <laughs> on here yeah, I'm glad to be on. The thing with those jacks, to get the big ones, like you said, you have to go through the numbers, and uh, you're you're definitely wore out by the end of the day, and especially after a two-day tournament, you're uh, you're really done for. <laughs> bet, man. I bet. Uh, hey, you mentioned on that the- Calcutta pole, are you fishing like subsurface structure or, or stuff on that protrudes the surface? Like, is it a cork setup? Are you fishing for, like Sheep said, the jig head or a Carolina rig? What's that look like? Yeah, so the, the structure that I've been fishing is concrete structure, and I'm fishing really shallow water between, you know, a foot and a half, three and a half foot of water, so really shallow. So, I, And I, I have a rig set up with just a split shot and a one-op gamakatsu hooks. That's the hooks that I use for when I'm targeting sheep's head. And uh, I just kind of, you know, bounce around all these structures with a fiddler crab and it, i will say the hard thing about the cane pole is filling the filling the bites you know when you're sheep's head fishing it's real subtle bites so you kind of have to pay attention to watching your line whenever you feel it or watch it you know bump up and down a few times and then wait till you feel the weight on the end of that uh that pole and then set the hook give it all you got and try and get them out of the structure man that's fun do you are you targeting are you like finding them on on your side scan on your machines or are you just kind of bouncing bouncing around until you find them or how are you finding these fish brandon yeah so i don't really use the uh my sonar actually i don't use it at all when i'm sheep's head fishing not this time of the year or in the shallow water uh these fish are pretty predictable especially you know from october to february right now you pretty much just find structure i mean you're looking for jetties anything concrete you know docks pylons bridges they're going to be there whether or not they eat or not that's that's kind of up to you and the, and the situations that you're dealt with but that's that's kind of what i'm looking for when i'm sheep's head fishing and so i've got a interesting story from this past weekend i had two charters i had one saturday and then i had one sunday and so you know y'all know we had this cold front come through sunday and it got super cold and it was mm-hmm. you know blowing 25 mile an hour north wind it was 37 degrees sunday so the day before you know, I've, I've probably done ran a dozen trips so far in the last couple of weeks catching these fish and had really great success. And so I hit, you know, the same usual areas Saturday and uh, had two young ladies on the boat and we tore them up. You know, we caught 20, 25 fish. And so the next day is, is when the cold front came through and it got super cold. And by the way, the water temperatures went from 73 degrees Saturday to it was 58 degrees at the launch where I launched that Sunday morning. That's how quick that temperature drop was. And so, you know, I didn't really think much of it. The area that I'd been fishing were kind of protected by the bank. So I'm like, well, I'll go hit these. So we we got out there. It's super rough, even with the protected bank. And we probably hit three or four different areas that I had been previously doing well, didn't even get a bite. Hmm. And I was starting, I was starting to get worried, you know, but this, this is shallow water. Like I said, I've been fishing in, which is, you know, two to four foot of water. So the only thing I can think is that these, these sheep said move deeper. Either they were still there and wouldn't bite or they just moved to deeper water. So I ended up running to a, a nearby bayou river and started fishing around some deeper water, 10 to 12 foot of water around old docks and concrete, stuff like that. And we got on them just like mm. that. I don't know. I'm sure the weather, the temperature had something to do with it. 
I don't, I couldn't think of anything else, you know, yeah. <laughs> No, that unless makes y'all, sense. Unless y'all know. No, uh, that would definitely make sense to me. The drop in water temperature. I think we got a little rain, so maybe that you know that shallower water was a little less salty. Maybe. Yeah, that, that I could think it be rained it. Sunday night. If you're talking about Sunday Monday, didn't it rain Sunday night? I think it was Saturday night, and then Sunday morning is when it was cold because that's when I had my trip. I just remember it was it was blowing too hard and and it was yeah. freezing. It was miserable yeah. conditions for sure. But it yeah, ended up being pretty, sense. and you know we caught fish. So. Yeah, that makes What's sense. Bad, fish, but, Fish push to deeper water whenever it gets colder. That's that's kind of what they do. Yeah, and I, I feel like that's probably going to be the name of the game for the next, you know, couple months uh, up until, you know, the springtime whenever they start spawning and kind of move off to the near shore rigs. Yep, I agree <laughs> with that. We talked to Captain Richard a minute ago, and he was saying that the tidal rivers are starting to show up and show out a little bit. He's seeing some water temperatures decrease and expected that to continue. I was looking at the weather forecast. It's going to be cold for a while, so I think it's kind of here to stay, so we should – uh I would think the water temperatures would keep declining and kind of get those fish into their winter pattern. Yeah. Yeah. I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, I know a lot of the trout fishermen are as well. And, uh, us, us sheep's head fishermen, you know, me, Tanner D's, we, we really love the sheep's head fishing. So that's kind of what we look forward to. And that's what I've been basing most of my charters off of. So we're really looking forward to it. Heck yeah. Bird in hand. Those oh, things are, like I said, they're taste so good. They are good too, man. They're uh, fun to fight too. Yeah, yeah. There, I mean, a couple reasons. They're, they they taste great. They fight good, and for the most time, they're pretty predictable. You know, sometimes them stuff with trout can be a little frustrating <laughs> yeah. sometimes, especially if you're not on the water every day or at least a couple times a week. Because especially in this transition period, you're not always sure where they may be at, or you, you'll know the general area, but you have to do some searching for them. Yep, definitely agree with that, man. Unlike sheep's head, you, you know, you find structure and you got the right bait. By the way, I, I, I like using filler crabs, and uh, they're kind of hard to find this time of the year, but I actually have a filler crab farm at my house. I don't know. <laughs> Tell us about, about this. About gotta, that. gotta hear about yeah. this. Yeah, it's a filler crab farm, or uh, as I call it, a crab attack. You know, <laughs> sounds pretty funny, but <laughs> it works. I love it. So, as y'all may know, in the summertime, you know, you go out on the beach and you'll see hundreds of filler crabs just kind of scattering, going in and out of their holes. And uh, in the wintertime, the colder months, they typically go underground just to uh, stay warm because any temperature under 65 degrees, they're, they're just not happy. And I don't know if they'll die or if they just have to go underground and get warm. Or I don't know really what that is, what the deal is. But so I've got a, basically a Coleman ice chest at my house. It's 150 quarts. I got it filled up with probably eight to 10 inches of sand and I've had crabs in it for up to two months is how long I've had it. And not a single one has died. What do you feed them? So they really don't eat a lot. I do have some fish flake food that I'll kind of sprinkle in there from time to time. But from what I've read, they're kind of like filter feeders. So they'll eat stuff in the sand and in the water and stuff like that. So I've had 500 up to 500 crabs in this, in this little uh, crab attack at a time. And so it's pretty easy whenever I get ready to go fishing, you know, I just got my backyard and grab six, seven, eight dozen crabs and put them in a little small bait bucket. And then I'm ready to go fish. That's and then incredible. whenever I get low, I'll go, I'll go to the bait shops, you know, buy 20, 30 dozen at a time. They look at me like I'm crazy, but I buy that many. And then I just put them in my uh, filler crab farm and I'll have them for the next couple of trips. Brandon, I'm just curious, how do outside of like, I mean, I caught them with my hands when I was a kid, but how do people catch, like, is there a way to like, is there a fiddler crab trap? Like, how do people catch them? Uh, a lot of people just kind of go flip rocks and stuff, especially this time of the year. There's always, well, most of the time it's mud crabs and stone crabs. You flip rocks and find them. You know, in the summertime, they're, you, you could see them, you know, just along the marsh banks and, and, and around the beach areas and you just see them scattered everywhere, but just right now, it's so hard to find them. Hmm. I'm not quite sure how the bait shop. That's what I was just about to say. I, I wonder know. how the bait shop gets them in, gets them in bulk. That'd be something interesting to find out. Got to be a trap of some yeah, sort, I, or, or a, like you're talking trap. about a big farm or something. I don't know. Yeah, it, I mean, it's got to be because it's a lot of work. No like, doubt. If you just want to go out and get 300, just say 150 filler crabs right now. It's going to be a struggle just because of how cold it is. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know if they've got, I've tried traps before, you know, you dig a hole in the sand, put a bucket in there, put a little bit of uh, shrimp or something and, you know, they'll crawl in it, fall in and can't get out. But I never had luck with that. Hmm. 
something to find out. I would love to know, but there. I'm sure. Uh, I've they have been in the South Florida this time of year. It's Florida, South Florida, or Texas. You think? I mean, you know, they deliver shrimp up here from those places. I mean, like, like he was saying, it starts getting cold. They ain't coming out the mud up here, so they got to be coming from somewhere like that, wouldn't you think? I mean, dude. But you guys have to go research this now. I, yep, got to find out. <laughs> so, I mean, I have noticed that, you know, the bait shops over here, they typically don't have them. But if you go across the bay to, you know, like Lost Bay or um, or any of the bait shops on y'all side of the bay, the east side of the bay, they typically have crabs. And maybe they're getting them because it's warmer over there, easier to find them, catch them. Or like you said, they're traveling a little further east where it's warmer and catching them and then bringing them back over. That's all I can figure. I bet they're doing that. Because I know J&M carries them, and they're bringing in shrimp from South, from usually South Florida, too. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, that's got to be what it is. Yeah, I would think so. But, yeah, so I just changed the water out. I've got little two fish fish bowls, uh, not fish bowls, dog bowls in there, and I'll fill them up with water, and every couple of days, you know, it'll kind of dry up. I don't know if they drink it or if it evaporates. I'll fill it back up with water from whichever river or bayou that I, I get the crabs from, or it doesn't really matter as far as the water, as long as it ain't just tap water, you know? Yeah. And then whenever it gets cold, I have two heat lamps out there that I'll, I'll turn on if it gets below 65 degrees, which right now I'll have to keep them on all the time. Yeah. But so far I haven't had any problems with them dying. It's yeah, that's really funny. convenient. Yeah, that's funny. And that's a, that's a great idea. That's a great tip for folks that like to chase the old sheeps and herd them convicts. I like that tip a lot. Yeah, that's right, for sure. Well, man, that's a great report. We look forward to hearing from you next time. If folks want to get up with you and book a trip or follow you on YouTube or check out your content, what's the best way to get in contact with you? Yeah, so y'all can check me out on uh, YouTube. It's uh, CAPT.Collier, Cap Collier. I'm also on TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, and uh, I'm also on Fish and Chaos, my, my charter business. So if y'all would like to go on there and just look up Captain Collier's charters, I've got all my rates and avail- availability on there as well. It was great talking to y'all and uh, hope to be on here again. Heck yeah, man. Look forward to hearing from you next time, buddy. Y'all be safe out there until next time. Yeah, you too. We'll see y'all later. That was a great inshore report from Captain Collier's Charters, Captain Brandon Collier. You guys check him out on YouTube. If you want to book a trip, check him out on Fishing Chaos. You guys take a quick break and check out a few of this week's sponsors. That report was brought to you by Admiral Shellfish. Admiral oysters are available at select restaurants and can also be purchased by the public at Bon Secours Fisheries, Inc. and Ahi Seafood in Fairhope, Alabama. Call for availability. From a simple, nutrient-dense appetizer at home or a shucking party with friends, Admiral oysters will steal the show. Follow their adventures on Instagram at Admiral Shellfish Co. And also brought to you by Photonis Defense. Photonis Defense is proud to offer the PD Pro line of night vision systems. The PD Pro series is the world's smallest and lightest night vision goggles built around the Photonis 16 millimeter filmless 4G image intensifier tubes in their hybrid filmless 18 millimeter image intensifier tubes. These ultra light, ultra compact night vision systems deliver cleanest images, best resolution, smallest, most transparent halo, and best overall performance and function of any night vision system available. The PDR Pro line consists of the PD Pro M 16 millimeter monocular, the PD Pro B 16 millimeter binocular, and the PD Pro Q panoramic night vision system. Photonist Defense, Masters of Darkness. All right, guys, before we hop into the next report, we're going to go check in with my buddy at the Northwest Florida Fishing Report, Joe Baia. We're going to be getting into some safety topics today, man. It's that time of year where those cold fronts come through, might catch you uh, off guard on the water. It's the best time of year to be fishing, in my opinion. It's fall, it's winter, it's going to be cold. Duck hunting season's right around the corner or we'll be here um, in no time. So we're going to get some safety tips from Paul Bernard over at the Recreational Boating Safety Program at the United States Coast Guard. What's going on, Butch? Oh, man, not a whole lot, buddy. Just uh, enjoying this beautiful day here in South Alabama, man. Wind's blowing a little bit. It's uh, starting to feel a little bit like fall outside. Yeah, yeah. We got some, uh, we got a nice cold front coming in, uh, some strong north winds, you know, and that really is something that is spurring this conversation, which yeah. is this is the time of year, you know, for, for our guys that, like to fish inshore, they're going into places where they don't typically spend a lot of time. They're not as familiar with those bodies of water. Our duck hunters are getting out on the water. Yep, it's about that time as well. I've been seeing several violates of ducks flying through here in the afternoons and in the mornings this time. 
Yep. And you get these strong north winds coming through. You've got a lot of exposed ground that is not normally exposed. You know, you get a low tide situation and a strong north wind. There's, there's a lot of water. water. There's a lot of exposed land showing. And there's a lot of places where you could run previously that you're not going to be able to get your bay boat into or your duck boat for that matter. And it seems like every year, you know, you hear about anglers and hunters getting themselves into trouble. And really, and truthfully, and the sad part about it is too, is most of it is preventable yep. where they at least could, they, they could have prevented the problem altogether, but they at least could have prevented worst case scenario, losing yeah. their they life. could have been more prepared, you know, right. If they had had what they needed. So today's a little safety reminder to that end. Who's our guest today? Yes, sir, man. We're going to be talking to Paul Bernard. Paul, tell us a little bit about what you do over there at the United States Coast Guard. And uh, yeah, just tell us a little bit about yourself. Hey, everybody. I'm, I'm Paul Bernard. I'm the Recreational Boating Safety Program Specialist at the Coast Guard's 8th District in New Orleans. The 8th District includes all or parts of 26 different states. And in and, and your area of coverage, uh, all of that area is part of the 8th Coast Guard District. I uh, spent 20 years on active duty with the Coast Guard, uh, wearing the uniform, running search and rescue and doing the law enforcement. And then I've spent some time as a civilian search and rescue controller and a, uh, and a, and a boating safety specialist. Well, thank you for your service, Paul. You know, I know that this is something that you had to deal with quite a bit and still deal with to this day. How big of a problem is, is this accidents? Like we're talking about with duck hunters, with, with anglers that are fishing out, you know, this time of year, as it's starting to get colder. Here's probably the most stark statistic. On a per, on a percentage basis, cold weather accidents are more likely to prove fatal by a considerable margin than those in better weather. And that, that, that cold water has a lot to do with it. So from a statistical standpoint, the likelihood of an accident being fatal during the, the colder weather is greater. And then also um, a couple of things struck near and dear to my heart. A, a college buddy of mine back in 2018 lost a family member to a, uh, a duck hunting accident on the Mississippi River. And then uh, two years ago, a, a game warden's son in Mississippi and his friend were, were lost in a, uh, in a hunting accident. And, and interestingly enough, the, the safety and preparedness translates very well from, from our duck hunters to our inshore fishers during the cold weather months. There's a, a lot in common with those two activities. We're, we're often running... Uh, winding bayous with blind bends and waterway intersections and um and and we're, we're faced with a lot of the same environmental conditions not only cold water but kind of the opposite of uh of the storm surge that you get with a tropical storm when the north winds blow when these cold fronts come through it blows water out of the marsh so if you're fishing shallow water where you have water one day the next day or even later the same day there may not be enough water to run in there later blind bends you know i think about growing up on foul river butch you live there now oh, i yeah. mean there's plenty of blind bends in foul river and this time of year we get a lot of people coming into the river who don't spend much time there and don't know how to run the river yep. and luckily we haven't had any big problems in there but gosh you know it's you see some scary stuff happening out there so Paul, what, what can folks be doing right? You know, I th the important part, right, is preventing this from happening. We don't yeah, want to avoid it altogether. Yeah, that would be so ideal. What, what's your advice for preventing these accidents to begin with? Let's go with the basic required equipment on, on duck boats and, and inshore fishers. There's really not a lot. You're uh, first and foremost, you're required to have your, your, uh, your, your life jacket on board. And obviously wearing that life jacket is the best preventative measure any boater can use to, to increase their likelihood of surviving an accident. It's that simple. And with modern inflatable PFDs, that excuse that a life jacket is too uncomfortable to wear, it just doesn't fly anymore. The vest styles uh, can easily fit over bulky uh, hunting clothing or, or, or bulky clothing that the, the cold water, cold weather boaters will want to wear. And the new inflatable belts are just so minimalistic, you'll forget that you have them on. Uh, my wife and I went on a kayak fishing trip not too long ago, we got out of the truck, started driving home. I looked over at her. I said, you still have your life jacket on. She looked at me and said, well, so do you. Yeah. It was well, I had literally forgotten the thing was there. So the excuse that they're they're cumbersome, bulky, restrictive, hot. Hot, uh, exactly. Yeah, it, it just doesn't fly with these new life jackets, guys. And um, so we also want our boaters, you got to have your uh, your state registration card on board and your registration numbers displayed. If your boat's 16 feet or greater, you have to have a throwable type 4 PFD on board. You have to have a sound producing device. And most boats will have to have a fire extinguisher where our inshore fishers and duck hunters 
operate. They, uh, they're not normally required to have flares, but it's never a bad idea to have those either. So really not a whole lot in terms of required equipment. Interestingly enough, statistically speaking, most of the boats out there meet the, um, the, the, the equipment carriage requirements, and that equipment is on board during these accidents. So it's typically, typically the operational kind of things that are finding our hunters and fishers in distressed situations. You mentioned the, the blind bends and these waterway intersections. They're really pervasive over here in the New Orleans area where I am in the uh, Mobile River Delta. It seems like it was about two years ago, two, uh, two boats engaged in a tournament bass fishing uh, event up in the Mississippi River Delta. Both came around a blind bend, collided, and there was a fatality in that accident. We, we see this often. One year when I was a search and rescue, controller, there were five different blind bend or waterway intersection, fatal accidents uh, in the immediate New Orleans area. So we have to round those bends and approach those intersections with the idea that there will be another boat coming from the other direction. So back off that speed and expect. I was about to say, if there's any doubt, slow down, I would have to imagine would be the best case scenario. Yeah, I treat those blind bends like a loaded gun, right? It just got to assume it's loaded and never never pointed in somebody's direction. Same thing there. You know, one of the things, Paul, I think about too, when I think about the way I like to fish and definitely the way I like to duck hunt is I'm getting up early and I'm trying to get on the water before anybody else. And so that usually means running in the dark. I was out not too long ago frog gigging with a buddy and we're running down the river and we got our spotlights and we're shining banks you know, and, and turn the spotlight off, run a little further. We're keeping our, keeping tabs on what's in front of the boat and how close we're getting to banks, making sure, you know, that we're, we're operating safely. We're coming down the river and another boat's coming our way. And he's got one of these slick led light bars on the front of that boat. And man, it just blinded us. I mean, we could not see, we had to shut down, totally get out of the way because you literally could not see. Are people aware of that problem uh running with these high intensity lights i'll tell you in my position that's probably the most common complaint that i get and it's also perhaps one of the more polarizing topics that we can we can discuss here because people become dependent on those light bars and look they're great at lighting up the 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 immediate area where you're proceeding what what they do that you you may not realize is the area outside of that area of illumination you cannot see as well there as you can if you're just operating with intermittent use of a spotlight. You're affecting your own night vision. And then if you do encounter another boater and you need to kill those lights, you've been exposed to so much light pollution that now your night vision is severely compromised. Think about it like this. When you go to bed at night and you turn off that bedroom light, if you're like mine and you have to have a switch and you turn it off and you walk to the bed, you have to feel your way to the bed. Same light conditions. When you get up first thing in the morning, or if you have to get up in the middle of the night for that, that restroom break, you can see well enough to move throughout that yeah. room. You're adjusted to that light conditions. That's exactly right. That's, that's the value of maintaining what I call light discipline. The less light pollution you have on your boat, the better you can see what's going on around you. And obviously, you're, the less likely you are to have a situation where Joe's uh, night vision was completely destroyed by another mm -hmm. boater. So we you get a lot of complaints about that and uh and so we just ask the boaters consider using spotlights because they are a focused beam and um and they're, they're they're easy to turn off and they're much less likely to create the light pollution that harms yours or other boaters night vision yeah i i think it's a that's definitely important to keep in mind it's not just about how well you can see it's about how other boaters can see it's the same the same thought process with these blind bends that you're talking about. You know, you got to think about the other guy as much as you think about yourself. Sounds like a great application for a PVS 14 monocular. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, really it'd be night perfect vision for night lot. vision. Yeah. I mean, another use for it, you know, being able to run and, and keep tabs on what's out, you know, keep tabs on, uh, on any uh, hazards and navigation without having to, Light blind pollution. other people what else yeah. do we need to be thinking about for safe operations and uh and really avoiding any of these accidents paul so let's play a little bit off of what butch just said the, the night vision technology is emerging it's very good and like so much electronic technology the price is coming down over time so if that's in your budget get some of that stuff it's great never ever forget though that the the, the very best resource you have is your own human eyesight speaking of technology um we, we see this un, uh, unfortunately too often. People have a GPS on board, 
which we recommend. You, you know, uh, fall, winter, and, and early spring boating is, is often the time that we see fog. So if you're running in the fog, please do not treat that GPS like it's a radar. While you can see where you're going, you cannot see other hazards and other boaters. And, and it happens, it, it will happen this year, at least once a year in our area, we'll see a boater is running at planing speeds in a socked in fog, using his GPS as his eyes and, and, and they strike either another vessel or a point of land that their, their, their GPS does not show. So exercise extreme caution with that, that, uh, that GPS. It is not a radar. It cannot show you the other hazards out there. Yep, or those lower water levels like you're talking about could be a sandbar there where, yeah, you got a breadcrumb there, but that could have been summer high tide, you know, <laughs> totally different. Let's talk about this might come as a surprise to you, but truly the biggest hazard for a boater is a fall overboard. And a fall overboard without a PFD in cold water is a is a life-threatening condition. Cold water shock, if you've never experienced it, is, is real. We have what we call the 1101 rule. If you fall into really cold water, you have about one minute where you'll just be struggling to get your breathing in order. You'll have that gasp reflex immediately when you hit the water. And if you happen to be underwater, when you have that gasp reflex, that's a, a very dangerous situation without uh, either with or without a personal flotation device on. And then you'll have, after that one minute, you'll have 10 minutes of reasonable functional time for self-rescue. And then you, your, your survival will, will go for about an hour beyond that, one hour beyond that. So one ten one. Uh, Cold, cold water, and that's, you know, cold, wa cold water can be water as cold as 60 degrees, and we definitely see that, and even colder uh, all across the coast here in, in the fall, winter, and spring months. So a PFD is, is your best friend there, and, uh, and equally importantly is having a plan for recovery. A lot of boaters go out without ever thinking about what they'll do, not if they fall in the water, but when. It's just a, a it's, I can't think of anybody who's who's boated long enough that hasn't fallen in the water at some point. So think about how you'll get others on board your vessel. Uh, small boats with low free board, you get uh, one person over on the side and another person trying to hoist them aboard. You could you could dunk the gunnel. Swim platforms can be a good way to get back on board. Uh, outboards that are that are shut down can make a, a reasonable ladder of sorts to get back in the boat. And if you're if you're like me and you spend time out there on the water alone. Having, uh, ha having a recovery ladder on board that you can just reach up and grab a, a rope and pull it over or some means for getting back on board, that's, that's an important part of it. And, uh, you know, if you're, if you're a duck hunter, you might have waders on. Um, you're not coming over that gunnel if the waders are full of water. Keep a uh, no. keep face belt tight on those waders so that uh, water doesn't get in there and you can affect either self-rescue or the rescue of your bud uh, much more easily. Paul, you're talking about falls overboard. A lot of times we're duck hunting, especially like, you know, Mobile, Tensaw River Delta is a good example. We may be using the river as our main roadway, so to speak, to get to portions of public land that we we're then going to walk in on. And in situations like that, you know, a lot of times we're taking like a brush clamp or something like that, and hooking on to some vegetation. And it seems like every year you hear about guys' boats drifting off. What do you do? What do you do uh, if somebody if your boat's adrift, you know, or you just lose lose your grip on it? Uh, what do you recommend people do? So I am a strong proponent of what our offshore fishers know as a ditch kit. This is a kit that contains safety, survival, and signaling equipment you'll need if you're ever stranded at sea or on some remote shoreline. Swimming for that boat is incredibly risky. Uh, two years ago, right here in the New Orleans area, we had two fatalities, and over in Texas, we had one where boaters swam after the boats, that cold water. You cannot function as well in it. So being a proponent of those ditch kits, when you go ashore, take that ditch kit with you. Have layered means of communication. A lot of the areas up there in that Mobile River Delta, you're not going to get cell service. If I'm remembering right from the time that I served in that area, cell service can be very spotty. Uh, so in addition to that cell phone, consider carrying a handheld VHF radio in that ditch kit. And uh, for, for me, it's a PLB. Uh, whether I'm offshore boating on my boat, a friend's boat, whether I'm kayaking, hiking, or bicycling in remote regions, I don't go anywhere without my PLB. And a PLB is, is just like an EPIRB but it's small. It's a personal locator beacon. It's a satellite beacon that's activated just like an EPIRB that sends a signal to a satellite 
and then back to our rescue coordination center right here in my office. And then we get that information and, and we respond. So layer your means of communication. Do not leave all your safety, survival, and signaling equipment on that boat when you make it off uh, and you go ashore. Take that kit with you. Absolutely. Just stick it in your shell bag. I mean, it shouldn't be that difficult, you know? No, uh, it, it, exactly. Um, I carry mine in a in a separate bag, Butch. I, I like a, a bag that floats. That's a great and, point, uh, too. Keep the water out. And I keep that in a float-free location on uh, on my boat or just right behind the seat of my kayak. So if I capsize, it's right there with me. Well, like you said, it's not a matter of if you've fallen in the water. It's just a matter of when. I mean, some point, if, if you've been on the water a long time and you haven't fallen in yet now is when you really ought to be really thinking about it because your day's probably coming here pretty soon well now you're freaking me out i don't even want to say it you need to be freaked out so question i have for you is you fall in in cold water you were talking about having a plan for being able to get back in the boat what's your plan for dealing with hypothermia is there anything you know our boaters can do to deal with that or is is it you're in the water get get back to the launch and and get in what what do you recommend for guys to be prepared with that's going to be situational, but uh, it's always a good idea to have a change of clothes. In my kayak, in the little front compartment, uh, a change of clothes goes with me. So, so that's an option. Uh, I layer too, and at some point, layers will will probably come off of me. So, there's probably a dry layer on the boat in addition to that those spare clothes that I can add back on if I do fall into the water. And uh, I am I, I'm extremely dependent on that. Uh, on that ditch kit as, as, as a key component of, of my, my safety posture. In it, there's survival blankets and there's emergency ponchos. Those things also fit nicely into jacket pockets for our duck hunters. That duck hunting jacket, it's got pockets all over it. Stuff these things in there. And if you make it to, if you happen to be separated uh, from, from your boat and ashore and you've got these things in your pocket, it gives you a fighting chance. What about a float plan? Whenever I'm thinking about going out in cold water, that is probably one of the most important things that could save your life. Walk us through some of the uh, basics of filing a valid or a proper float plan. Absolutely, Butch, and I'm glad you reminded me of that. First things first, if, we, if we're smart with our communication strategy and we have a layered communication strategy that's not overly dependent on any one thing, a lot of our inshore boaters are going to use that, that cell phone as primary, put it in a floating waterproof pouch because cold, wet fingers on a wet phone is probably not gonna work for you. So as part of that float plan, just tell, uh, tell somebody where you're going, who's going with you, when you anticipate being back so that if you do not return on schedule, they can call the Coast Guard. And here's an important thing that I've started tacking onto this whole idea of filing a float plan is leave a picture of your vessel. Last year, right here in the New Orleans area, we took a, a report of an overdue duck hunter. And, and the word we got was that his boat was gray. So our rescuers went out there searching for a gray boat. We flew over a camouflage boat. Nothing looked amiss with it. About two hours after that helicopter landed, we got a picture of the boat we were looking for. It was oh, not no. gray. It was camouflage. Oh, so no. so <laughs> we, uh, everything worked out well with this, and we were able to, uh, to, to correlate that, that boat to the one we had seen earlier. And and we were able to affect the rescue. But uh, please include a picture of that boat. It, it matters in a number of ways that I want to, that can help us uh, beyond just the obvious. Paul, this is a great time to bring this to the top of everybody's mind. But really and truly, this is stuff that you need to be thinking about every time you hit the water, whether it's duck hunting season, cold water, warm water, doesn't matter. You always need to have this safety first and foremost. You don't have time to react and do something about it when things happen. So if folks want to go check out online resources from the U.S. Coast Guard or otherwise, where do you recommend they go for that checklist? You know, that they can say, all right, I remember what they said on the podcast, but before I go out next time, I'm going to, I want to run through and I want to make sure I got everything I need to have before I hit the water. So we have a Coast Guard National Boating Safety website. That is uscgboating.org, USCG boating.org. And then uh, because so many people use social media, I wanted to give the boaters we serve an opportunity to reach us via social media. So we created a, um, a boating safety Facebook group here for the Coast Guard 8th District as a way for us to disseminate information to our boaters and for them to reach us for questions. And that is facebook.com slash groups slash safe 
voting. Facebook.com slash groups slash safe voting. And um, interestingly enough, uh, we uh, we ran an article on uh, on cold cold water and, and duck hunting operations out on our uh, on our Facebook group today. And uh, we would invite anybody to come and look at that and share it with their friends on on their groups that are local to their areas. That's great advice, man. Well, like Perfect, I said, man. we appreciate you coming on and giving everybody a, a, a reminder, but also a good synopsis of uh, what they need to think about getting out on the water this fall. Uh, we'll be looking forward to having you on again sometime soon. We, we need to keep these, these safety tips top of mind as much as possible. Yep. Enjoyed it, Paul. Thank you. Yo, Joe and Butch, let me, let me hang one more thing out there for you. Uh, we, we kind of touched on weather, but these, these cold fronts and, and, the, and the storms that pop up in front of them, they take the lives of far too many boaters. And with technology being what it is, it's way too easy to monitor the weather radar and thunderstorm. So whether you use the .gov National Weather Service radar or one of the apps, like one that I have on my phone, look at that weather radar before you go out and monitor it throughout your voyage, please. That's great, great tips, man. Thanks for being on and sharing your wisdom yeah. with our listeners. We really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, Paul. Thank you, gents. But you remember that time we started the Dolphin Island Polar Bears Club? <laughs> I do, actually. That was terrible, to yeah, be honest we were, with you. Yeah, we were like, we're going to jump in the water in every winter month, right? Every, we every did, month like, of the winter. Yeah, We, we started jumped in, in on Christmas Day. Yep. And then we jumped in uh, right around mid-January. Mm -hmm. And then we jumped in in February. That was by far the worst one. And he's talking about that, uh, that shock. Oh yeah. That cold water shock. And that first, oh, it was minute. real. Yeah. Like you couldn't breathe. I mean, it, you couldn't it even was, swim. You couldn't hardly get back to the dock for me. Like, me too. Yeah. you know, cause we were out there having fun, you know, we come out the house and run down there and dive off the dock and you, you'd done it the two months previous, you know? So you think, Oh, what? Well, it was cold, but it wasn't that bad. Wasn't that bad. In December. Yeah. It was, it was colder, but it, it wasn't that bad. And Jane, when we hit the water in February, man, it was like somebody, had just knocked the wind out of you. Hit you with a sledgehammer in your chest. Yeah, it was yeah. no joke. And it was like, get me out of this water yeah. now, right yeah. now. I don't even think I got wet. I was out of the water so fast. Yeah, I can't imagine that happening in a, that happening in a situation to where you had to make some decisions and do something quickly to get your butt back in gear. Yeah, couple that with having a bunch of clothing on. Waiters, you possibly. Just got knocked out of a boat. Yeah. Maybe you've got people that you care about that have also gotten knocked out of a boat. Like everybody thinks they're tough until yeah. something bad happens. And then you realize you're not that tough. And what's going to save you is being prepared. prepared. Yeah, Hopefully 100%. you can prevent it from happening, but being prepared for that moment and not enough of us do it, man. Only thing I'll leave with that is, is don't think it's not going to happen to you. Right. Don't think that you're think too it experienced. Is happen to you. Don't think that you're too experienced for it to not happen to you. Right. You need to think that it is going to happen to you and hope that it yep. doesn't. And be ready. That's right. That's the yep. best case scenario. I agree and with you, Cap. And that's not a scare tactic. I mean, that's just that's no, just the reality. Not. If if everybody did that, there would be no fatalities from this. Yep. Agree. Because it, all this stuff is preventable. Y'all go check out those resources that Paul was talking about. If you want to run through a checklist or just, you know, just rewind and listen to everything he's saying, make sure that when you go out, you've got all the things that he talked about ready to roll so that you're prepared to deal with these situations. Uh, should they happen? All right, Butch, I'm gonna go get the rest of these reports, man. Always, uh, always good to remind everybody about safety. Yes, sir. Sounds great, man. I have to go get the rest of my reports as well, man. Y'all have a good show. We'll talk to you next time. All right, guys, that wraps up another great segment. You got to take a quick break and check out a few of this week's sponsors. That segment was brought to you by CCA Alabama, a great way to support conservation projects like the Claw Petite Flounder and Speckled Trout Hatchery in the University of South Alabama Cobia Tagging Project is through the purchase of a distinctive CCA Alabama saltwater fishing license plate. You guys head over to Alabama Department of Revenue's distinctive license plate page at revenue.gov to get yours. And also brought to you by Richardoni Family Dentistry. Dr. Josh is a local dentist with 11 years of experience and is also an avid angler. He enjoys ripping lips as much as he enjoys making your smile perfect. At Richard Ardoni Family Dentistry, they treat their patients like family and friends. They accept most dental insurances and see patients of all ages. Is your skin a little wrinkled from years of sun damage? Dr. Josh also offers cosmetic Botox. 
Don't let an achy tooth or a broken tooth from biting your fishing line too much keep you from a great day outdoors. Or if you just need a checkup, call them today at 251-342-6672 to book an appointment today. All right, Angelo, you know we got to do what did you learn before we get out of here today, man? What did you learn? I learned that you can catch sheep's head on a cane pole. It sounds pretty beneficial. I mean, look, I, I like hopped on his YouTube channel real quick because I was like, I, I, I wanted to see it. I got to see this. <laughs> I got to see it. Uh, and like, I mean, he, he was like fishing oyster farms and like, uh, I, I think like you see this on the north end of the island. I definitely see it like on the bayou where they have these concrete kind of breakwaters. Oh yeah, uh, they're everywhere now. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think that's a good way that that people are kind of rebuilding the shoreline and stuff. Yeah, they're outside of they're outside of the mouth of fowl now. They're outside of the mouth of dog. I think, um, like you said, all around the island. They're outside of the bayou. They're all around the Mississippi Sound. Dude, and, and like like when you look what he's doing, it's kind of hard to flip a rod and reel for sure. Close combat. It, yes, and, but like you got like a fifteen foot cane pole. Like, I mean, you can quickly fish four or five of these things from the bow of your boat and move fish four or five more. Yeah. It, it seems super efficient. Mm -hmm. it looked like a hell of a good time. It looks like a lot of fun. You know, like to me, part of the fun of catching like grouper and snapper and stuff is like you just like hammer down on the drag and say so part boat of up. Yeah. It, it is like really loading up on the, like loading the rod up. Like it looked like the same thing with those. It's, Reminds me of crappie fishing. Yeah, uh, exactly. One of those like big long brim busters. Yep, looks like a lot of fun. I'm gonna have to try that for sure. What did you also, learn? Also, he has a fiddler crab farm. The only person I know that has a crab attack. I will agree. I will agree with the crab attack. <laughs> uh, I liked hearing from him, man. That's a great addition to the fishing report for sure. Man, I would say what I picked up from this show was if you're headed out, you know, it's that time of year where you got to start running the rivers and. uh you know, fishing some of these tidal rivers and tributaries around Mobile Bay. Captain Richard gave a, gave a great tip of, you know, finding that biomass of fish. And if you're upriver of them, you're not going to be in the fish. If you're downriver of that biomass, you're not going to be in the fish. So kind of start at one end or the other and work your way up or work your way down until you find that biomass and uh, work on them. Sounds like the Slick Juniors have been working well. I know Captain Patrick um, did good in one of the tidal rivers yesterday, and he was using the big Slick or the original Slick. So, yeah, I think it's about to be gangbusters, man. It sounds like it's shaping up. Dude, Thanksgiving holidays are coming up. I mean, if you're not a deer hunter, and I imagine we have a lot of listeners that are deer hunters, but I'm not a deer hunter. Yeah. I mean, dude, it's so easy to get in the boat and just go spend a couple hours, you know, drifting down these down these rivers. But right. it did give us enough to where to go and what to look for. I think, I think like, especially him being, like, look at the, for that biomass, like that there is enough and he kind of explained hey they you know they ain't always at the bottom of the in the top of the river they were in the middle of the river yeah that's good information all right guys that wraps up another great segment you guys take a quick break and check out a few more of this week's sponsors that segment was brought to you by lnm marine lnm marine has something for everyone from small hunting boats pontoon boats to bigger bay boats and offshore hybrids lnm marine llc prides itself on its customer service and knows how important it is to have someone you can trust and to be taken care of they are locally owned and regularly support the community lnm marine provides superior customer service and has an entire team that consists of professional sales members finance experts service technicians and a knowledgeable parts and accessory staff to support you go visit their friendly reliable and experienced staff now located only six miles north of i-10 at 34600 highway 59 in stapleton alabama or give them a call at 251-937-1380 all right angelo that was a fun show man it's always good to co-host with you i appreciate you joining me today dude i like uh, you know as much as i like the summertime shows i love this time of year yeah you learn a lot you do learn a lot Yep, and this was a you know typically like you say i'm a i'm a hunter so this was never this was never a time of the year where i ever did any fishing you know offshore was my game so to get into the cold water inshore game is a whole different ball game for me so that's been fun to learn yep all right man enjoyed it you guys check out I'm the here. coastal connection for all your real estate needs we appreciate you being a sponsor of great days outdoors man man i feel so lucky and and just honors and blessed to be involved with what you guys are doing you know if there's anybody out there listening that's considering sponsoring, i can tell you personally that it's worked for me it's been good ROI. 
We appreciate it, man. We'll we'll, we'll talk to you next time. Next time we'll have to set All up right. a, a December co-host show. Let's do it. Let's do it. All right, buddy. Y'all be safe, man. Have a good Thanksgiving. You too. This week's Alabama Saltwater Fishing Report brought to you by me, Angelo DiPaola, The Coastal Connection. Find us online at thecoastalconnection.com. And also brought to you by Sam Stop and Shop. Sam Stop and Shop is your one-stop shop located at 27122 Canal Road in Orange Beach. Sam's has a little bit of everything, including a deli, inshore, offshore, and surf fishing tackle. They also have bait, clothing, groceries, name brand sunglasses, and so much more. Stop by and shop or call them at 251-981-4245 today. And also brought to you by Test Calibration. Test Calibration is your source for sales and service of diesel turbochargers and fuel injection systems since 1976. Contact them at 800-822-0057 or visit them online at testcalibrationdieselandturbo.com. And also brought to you by Bucks Island. They have new pontoon boats, bass boats, bow riders, and aluminum boats for sale. They provide boat service on all kinds of boats, even if they weren't purchased from Bucks. Visit them at 4500 Highway 77 in Southside, Alabama, or give them a call at 256-442-2588. Also brought to you by MB Ranch King. MB Ranch King hunting blinds and feeders are built to last, right here in the USA. They offer high quality, easy to use corn and protein feeders that can be filled with both feet on the ground. Call Kevin today for more info or a quote at 205-807-2937. MB Ranch King, built in the pursuit of perfection. Also brought to you by Hilton's Real-Time Navigator, bringing you the highest quality online satellite fishing charts since 2004. Your source for sea tips, altimetry, currents, and water color at hiltonsoffshore.com. And also brought to you by National Land Realty. If you're in the market to sell your land, check out the fastest growing, most innovative land brokerage in the country at nationalland.com. And also brought to you by Fish Bites. Since 1999, Car Specialty Baits, Inc. has been busy revolutionizing the fishing industry with their game-changing brand of baits and lures called Fish Bites. Check out the full line of scented saltwater and freshwater baits at fishbites.com. Also brought to you by Dixie Supply and Baker Metalworks are proud to be your metal roofing headquarters for over 40 years. Save time and money by buying from the most reliable manufacturer on the Gulf Coast. Buy it today, pick it up today. With the addition of their new store in Cantonment, Florida, they now have eight locations to serve you. Dixie Supply and Baker Metalworks, your metal roofing headquarters. And also brought to you by Killer Doc. Killer Dock uses marine grade aluminum to make fabulous fish cleaning tables and stunning canopies that will keep us out of the sun. Killer Dock combines durability, function, and design to uniquely upgrade your entire dock experience. Visit KillerDock.com to see more.